second last time. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm Roger Ebert. We have split the worst movies of 2002 into handy categories. And the first category is the ever-popular Big Stars and Big Bombs. Movies where even big names above the title couldn't save right, lousy lady, material. For example, Life or Something Like It, where Angelina Jolie plays a Seattle TV reporter whose ignorance of her medium is matched Jane. only by the movies. Are you one of the many faceless men and women who toil in the streets, guiding your diesel Goliath through the blighted cityscape to make sure that we get home safe and sound? Another big bomb with big stars was Bad Company, a comedy thriller starring Chris Rock as the long-lost twin of a CIA operative. When the first twin is killed, the second one is recruited from a life of ticket scalping and chess hustling, and it's up to CIA handler Anthony Hopkins to teach him in exactly nine days how to move in diplomatic circles, use weapons, speak foreign languages, and all of that kind of stuff. Dry, but never precocious. I love your shirt. Egyptian broadcloth? Chris Rock is one of the smartest actors in the movies, which is why he shouldn't be in dumb movies. Another big star, megawatt diva Jennifer Lopez, played a battered wife named Slim who seeks revenge in Enough, a cynical piece of exploitation that defies credibility at each and every turn. It takes Slim seven years to figure out that her creepy husband is a philandering psychopath, but it takes only about a month for her to become an unstoppable fighting machine. Maybe she got lessons from Anthony Hopkins. We both know I only have to hit you once. There's one good hit, and that's over. Even more odious is The Sweetest Thing, an appallingly unfunny mess with Cameron Diaz flouncing all over the place as she tries to squeeze some laughs out of a gross-out road trip movie with a nothing love story. Diaz and Christina Applegate dive into one demeaning gag after another, I guess in an attempt to prove that disgustingly lame body-fluid comedies aren't the exclusive domain of the guys. Point taken. Oh, Jesus! I don't know. I don't even know how long it's been in here. What is in here? Oh, Jesus. Oh. We know Diaz is a comedic gamer from her work in There's Something About Mary, but flopping on the floor of a filthy washroom, modeling bad underwear, and shrieking as a piece of rotten food flies at you isn't brave, it's just desperate. You know, in a way, these actors are faced with a kind of crapshoot, because when she looked at the screenplay for There's Nothing About Mary, it must have looked as bad as this, but it turned out to be a masterpiece, so sometimes you just can't tell. Well, I think crapshoot is the apt term here when we talk about the screenplays in question, because I think they're all bad, although I did like Life or Something Like It, because I thought Angelina Jolie was charming in there, and I'm just going to stick well, with that. Okay, well, I like Lara Croft Tomb Raider, and I thought she was charming in there okay. and had better costumes, too. Okay, so we like Angelina Jolie. Let's agree okay. on that. But our next category is bad bonding, films that are pale imitations of the lethal weapon formula or lame brain buddy action thrillers or both. Take the prison riot debacle half past dead with the corpulent 51-year-old Steven Seagal playing an undercover FBI agent who teams up with rapper actor Ja Rule. Perhaps taking the movie's title too literally, the wooden Seagal mumbles and hides in the shadows while Ja Rule, with exaggerated tough guy expressions, mugs like a silent movie actor. you a player. Read a book. What's this, man? When lovers... It's a good book. You can't be serious. At least Half Past Dead has a few unintentional laughs, but the horribly titled Ballistic X vs. Sever is deadly. This time, it's Antonio Banderas as the rogue government agent and Lucy Liu as a mysterious, revenge-minded assassin. One of them is X and the other is Sever, and it's a good thing they don't get married because X Sever sounds like a skin condition. The Rotten Tomatoes website collected 88 reviews of Ballistic X vs. Sever, and the movie scored a perfect zero. <laughs> Nobody recommended it. Congratulations. You know you're in trouble when you bottom out on the tomato meter. My selection in the bad bonding category is a Jackie Chan bomb named The Tuxedo. Jackie is hired as a chauffeur for a billionaire secret agent. When the agent is injured, Jackie inherits the man's $2 million tuxedo, which is fully automated, so all Jackie has to do is push buttons and the suit does the rest. Caution demolition mode. The tuxedo will consider any object a target and act to destroy it. And who plays his sidekick? 
Jennifer Love Hewitt. That must have been a fascinating <laughs> casting decision. Anybody can put on a magic suit and bounce around a room in computerized animation, but it takes a Jackie Chan to do it without the suit. The movie's plot, by the way, involves a villain who wants to poison the world's water supply, but if everybody is dead, what has he conquered? <laughs> and you're right. The whole thing about Jackie Chan as well, isn't that amazing? I mean, this yeah. thing might have worked, might have worked as a cartoon. Mm -hmm. That's the only way it possibly could have worked. But to put Jackie Chan in this vehicle just defies description that people would think, let's green light this idea. And not any cartoon, a South Park cartoon. There you go. Maybe that one. Okay, coming up next, drag movies that were a drag Hello, for us. Hi. So, where did you girls say you were from again? New Bermuda. Continuing our special show on the worst movies of the year, our next category is named They're a Drag, and it consists of movies in which men dress as women but are no funnier than they would be if they were dressed as the abominable snowman. <laughs> Sorority Boys is about three guys who are thrown out of their fraternity and decide to dress in drag and pledge a sorority. These are characters <laughs> with IQs in the low single digits, and the movie is too stupid to be funny. I was also appalled by the Rob Schneider body switch comedy, The Hot Chick, where some magic earrings align the trade bodies with a sexy high school senior. So we get Rob Schneider with a teenage girl inside of him, and after he convinces his girlfriend it's really him, the movie takes this promising premise and turns it into an excuse for jokes about bodily functions, bodily fluids, and body parts. So, uh, can I see it? I don't think you get the gravity of the situation here. I'm sorry. Can I see it? One rule of comedy is that it's hard to be funny when it's obvious that you're trying to be funny. Great comedies take their premises seriously and the laughs flow naturally. That was the case with Tootsie, a drag movie the makers of these films obviously did not study closely. Joanna Man is a cross-dressing comedy that does want to be Tootsie, but doesn't even reach the level of Big Mama's house. Miguel Nunez is the obnoxious pro basketball star whose antics get him kicked out of the men's league, so he shaves his legs, gets a wig, straps on fake boobs, and takes the women's league by storm. And, because everyone in this movie is a moron, the ruse works. So relaxing. I'm looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it, too. I'm feeling relaxed already. Contrary to the age-old Hollywood belief, the mere act of putting a man in woman's clothing isn't inherently funny. It's what happens after the guy wobbles in the heels and complains about the waxing that either makes or breaks the comedy. Joanna Man is a one-sentence concept that never takes that second step. Now, you know, in all fairness to Rob Schneider, he didn't really make a drag comedy because he actually occupied the other body. But on the other hand, yes. it's just as bad as if it had been a drag comedy. And for that matter, in Sorority Boys, do you think they're acting so badly just so nobody will think they really want to look like girls? I don't know what these guys were thinking. They're certainly not passable as women. I don't even know if they're passable as actors. But I mean, <laughs> you do have to be believable on some level as a woman uh, with the other characters for the comedy to work. In, the, in Sorority Boys, he looks about as much like a woman as Milton Berle does. And when his dad asks him out on a date, I'm just hiding my, my eyes. I really am. Coming up next, movie franchises that we've had enough of. What do we got? Google it. Okay. So bitter. It's like my algebra teacher on bread. We continue our look at the worst films of 2002 with perhaps the most frustrating category, a great cast mired in a deadly ensemble vehicle. We'd like nothing more than to cast away these duds. Superstar director Steven Soderbergh took a break from big-time hits like Ocean's Eleven and Traffic and Aaron Brockovich to make the Hollywood satire full frontal. Shot in 18 days for $2 million, the film looks like it was shot in 18 hours for about two grand. Soderbergh favorite Julia Roberts lampoons herself by playing an actress playing the magazine journalist in Soderbergh's movie within the movie, but the in-jokes were thin awfully fast, and what we're left with is self-conscious and smug. Another self-indulgent ensemble movie that toys with our perceptions of reality is Just a Kiss, the directorial debut of character actor Fisher Stevens. Ron Eldard, Marissa Tomei, Kira Sedgwick, Tay Diggs, and Marley Shelton are among the good-looking dimwits who sleep around with each other and spout fortune cookie philosophies about life and love. I sleep with other men besides Peter. Oh. Peter knows. And how does he feel about that? He wants me to stop. 
Stevens needlessly plays with rotoscoping animation techniques just because he can and slaps us with an ending that's only slightly more original than the old it was all a dream trick. Just a Kiss is a pretentious mess. Speaking of unwanted ensembles, there's a whole genre of movies about insanely colorful, hard-drinking southern ladies of a certain age who are supposed to be funny and colorful and charming even though our blood would curdle if we had to be in the same room with them. Last year's example was Divine Secrets of the Ya Ya Sisterhood, the heroine played by Ellen Burstyn has a husband played by James Garner who seems paralyzed by long years of marriage to her and no wonder. There is no shame in what happened. That was a different time and you were a different person. Another ensemble movie that sure didn't work was Waking Up in Reno, starring Billy Bob Thornton, Charlize Theron, Patrick Swayze, and Natasha Richardson as two couples from Little Rock who make a road trip to Reno and discover all sorts of things about themselves that are more interesting to them than they are to us. I know how to fix everything. Darlene and Roy got to sleep together. It'll make it even. It's like a dealer trade-in. Lots of very serious issues involving infidelity, lying, and trying to get pregnant are all jumbled up here into a sitcom pitched at breakneck speed, so there's no way the actors can even halfway seem to be dealing with the material. Instead of waking up in Reno, they seem just plain maroon there. Yeah, and we're stranded with them. Waking up in Reno, everybody's running around and jumping around and hitting each other. And you know, there's just that desperate feel. They had to know, these actors, these smart actors, had to know this was awful material. And yeah, yeah, sisterhood, it was like the blah, blah, blah sisterhood. I mean, that thing just went on forever. Don't you think the clock has run out on the idea that it's funny that a woman is taking her temperature to see when she can conceive? Yeah, I think the clock ran out on that about 1972. Okay, our next category is called No More McMovies. And this is devoted to franchises that have exhausted their original inspirations, if indeed they had any, and should be now retired. The original Men in Black was a very popular film, especially because of special effects that created weird alien creatures. But they've lost their freshness in this sequel. They're under suspension right now for stealing from the duty-free shop. Uh, we were free. Yeah. Since we're homophobic. Yay! Hey. Hey, somebody said you were dead. You look good. We're double part. Yeah. Neither Will Smith nor Tommy Lee Jones seems all that happy to be doing the film. Jones hardly allows an expression to even cross his face. And the most interesting character is a talking dog named Frank. Thought I'd never get out of that mailroom. My conclusion, we do not need Men in Black 3, although we might be able to see Dogs in Black 3. Okay, Ice Cube had a breakthrough role in 2002 with Barbershop. But he was also the primary culprit responsible for Friday After Next, the third and junkiest entry in a franchise that really didn't have much comedic steam in the first place. Cube, who wrote the screenplay and was co-producer, is Craig, and Mike Epps is back as Day Day. This is uh, my young girl, Donna. Say hi, woman. Hi. All right, that'll be quite enough. Thank you so much. How ironic that Jesse Jackson protested the much superior barbershop when he should be complaining about all the cliches about lazy, scheming, jive-talking blacks on display in Friday After Next. So what are they going to call the next one, a week from Friday After Next? Well, I hope they don't have a next one to call, but they could call it Maybe I Still Know What You Did Last Friday. There's nothing you can do to make this movie funny. The characters aren't funny. I did like Men in Black, too, and I do think that that franchise still has some steam in it. Do you have any plans for Awakening, Tommy Lee Jones, for the sequel? It seems to me it would be cruel to make him make a third movie. Maybe they can just hold up a big, fat paycheck, and that'll make him smile. How about that? Okay, coming up next, every year there are a lot of bad movies, but few as wretched as these remakes. Hey, come on now. Is Retro Disasters, TV shows adapted into movies that were warmed over second helpings or bland imitations of the originals. Eddie Murphy had a disastrous 2002 with the triple bill of Showtime, The Adventures of Pluto Nash, and I Spy, which takes the name but little else from the groundbreaking 1960s TV show. Murphy is a loudmouth boxing champ mentored by government agent Owen Wilson for a secret mission that involves a three-step formula. Bantering, explosion, car chase. Bantering, explosion, car chase. You see that? That was a big explosion. Man! And crime-solving canine Scooby-Doo and his dopey friends finally made the leap from TV cartoon to feature film in 2002, and the result was nearly unwatchable. The acting was stiff, the story lacked any trace of wit, the sets looked like they were borrowed from Gilligan's Island, and the CGI Scooby appeared every inch the artificial creation. Get the dog. Scooby-Doo was a major hit, and that means we're going to get a sequel. Maybe they can call it Scooby-Doo 2, The Search for a Plot. 
or maybe Scooby Doo Doo. <laughs> From retro disasters, we move on to a related category, wretched remakes. Is there anything more depressing than a movie that was good the first time and then is bad the second time? My first wow. example is Mr. Deeds, the Adam Sandler retread of the Frank Capra classic. Wow. The remake turns Mr. Deeds into a seething mass of barely repressed aggression and includes scenes of hostility that are in peculiar contrast to the rest of the film. And if it wasn't for Miss Dawson being here, I'd probably knock your heads in. Ooh. I don't mind. Okay. Here we go. Another wretched remake was John McTiernan's version of Rollerball, first made in 1975 by Norman Jewison. The movie stars a real mixed cast. Chris Klein, Jean Reno, LL Cool J, and Rebecca Roman Stamos, and is set in a Central Asian Republic where Renault dreams of establishing his deadly new sport and making millions by selling it to American cable television. The integrity of the game must be maintained for the people to keep their heroes alive. And to keep them gambling, of course. There's one slight problem. The sport is so deadly that it can never develop any stars because they get killed in every match. And so incoherent is this movie that no one in the movie is ever able to explain the sport. Well, I think Rollerball is the most disappointing of these movies because I like the original from the 70s with James Caan, but because it's like about a techno sport, because it's set in the future, you'd think with better technology, better special effects, something like this could be updated and could be an improvement, but they go wrong at every turn with this Their thing. set looks as cheesy as the original roller derby set, and did anybody in devising the sport wonder if there would be a problem since the track yeah. does a figure eight so the people would have a lot of crashes well, right about here it ain't no quidditch is it okay coming up next the absolute worst movies of the year they say there are three ways to prepare a healthy great tasting annual film festival at sea preview the hottest new movies and enjoy lively discussions with the critics Roger and Richard sail to the Bahamas in Disney's Castaway Key, February 20 through 23rd. Aboard the Disney Wonder, Ebert and Roper's Film Festival at Sea. Call your travel agent or 1-800-945-3806. We've subjected ourselves and you to some terrifying moments from some terrible movies before we can all wipe them from our memory banks. And yet, there are two films that are even lousier than the aforementioned Drek. My selection for the worst film of 2002 is Swept Away, directed by Guy Ritchie and starring his wife Madonna, and the movie could be Exhibit A in a both fault divorce. <laughs> we have landed on a deserted island! That's impossible, you idiot. Number one, don't ever insult me again. Number two, if you want food, you will have to earn it. Madonna plays a wealthy harridan who abuses Adriano Giannini's earthy fishermen until the tables are turned and they're shipwrecked on a remote island. These are two of the most unlikable leads in the history of film romance. If sharks had circled their raft, we would have been rooting for those sharks. You know, when they kissed her the first time, I was really surprised no one was injured. <laughs> With all due respect to Swept Away, which is certainly an excellent choice, Thank Richard, you. Thank you. I think the worst movie of the year was obviously Death to Smoochie, which provides evidence that movies about clowns are usually awful. This one is so bad, only enormously talented people could have made it because lesser filmmakers would have lacked the nerve. Oh, we'll get you off that smackle, yes we will. Oh, we're gonna get you off that smack. We'll kick that monkey right off your back and get your life on track, oh yes we will. Robin Williams stars as a bad clown named Rainbow Randolph who is jealous because a good clown named Smoochie played by Edward Norton, what is he doing in this movie, gets a coveted TV time slot. Catherine Keener is the network executive in the middle. Robin Williams, Edward Norton, Catherine Keener, a neo-Nazi rally, a lesbian hit squad, a woman with a fetish for kitty show hosts, and the movie was directed by the great Danny DeVito. What were they thinking? I don't know what they were thinking. You're right. I mean, you have all this talent, and it just goes wrong every step of the way. Usually, when a movie with this much talent behind it is so bad, you even get a cult following. People who say, no, we love no, Death no, to Smoochie, no, no here's cult. why. No I have cult. seen no such cult following for this movie. If I were being told that I was going to see a movie directed by Danny DeVito and starring no. Robin Williams, Catherine Keener, and Edward Norton, I would be getting there early in order to be first in line. And, and if it was Death wow. to Smoochie, you'd be running for the exit. Oh, yep. Well, remember... You can check out our website at evenandroper.tv or at movies.com and readers in print at suntimes.com where you will find coverage of much better movies. Next week, we'll be back with a look at the careers of Hollywood's big guns, Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise.
Until then, the balcony is closed. You know, if I had to see Death to Smoochie or Swept Away again, I would just close my eyes for four hours. I mean, I would rather look at nothing than have to revisit this junk. They ought to show them at charity premieres in order to raise money to destroy the film. <laughs>